This is the King Rune KP5L. It's a brand new printer from the company that makes the KP3S, probably the best printer you can get for under $200. I was curious as to whether the KP5L would bring the same kind of value for money, so I bought one. On paper, the KP5L sounds like a good deal. It's a large format, i3 style 3D printer with a direct extruder, dual Z screws, silent drivers, and all the usual bells and whistles. There are plenty of other big bed slingers with a similar feature set. Sidewinder X2, SVO3, hell, even the CR10V3 if you hate yourself. But those are all in the $450 range, with the KP5L lists for only $350. You can get it for as little as $300 if Big Daddy Jeff smiles on you and offers you a coupon. All those other big printers in this price range use V-slot rollers for their motion system. Rollers pretty much suck. All the cool kids have linear rails, and so does the KP5L. Sort of. They're not the usual MGN12 rails, which most better printers use. They're sort of a weird rail extrusion hybrid. Pretty sure it's these things, which I've never seen on a 3D printer before. Do they work? Yes, but we'll get to that. First, the usual review bullshit. The KP5L comes in a box with a ton of closed cell foam. The packaging is fine. The two halves of the printer are bolted flat for shipping, which is pretty smart. Also in the box are the requisite cables, half a dozen screws, the display, and the usual array of trash tier accessories. You get an unlabeled 16GB microSD card and adapter, some Chinesium hex wrenches, the ubiquitous blue handle diagonal cutters, and about a dozen feet worth of truly terrible silk PLA filament. Oh, they do give you an actual socket wrench for the nozzle, which is a nice touch. The roller skate style spool holder is shitty and annoying, so I didn't use it. I recommend printing a non-shitty spool holder at your earliest convenience. Assembly is simple and pretty standard for new printers these days. You basically bolt the top half onto the bottom half and plug in the necessary connectors. The manual has a grand total of five images showing in the process. Six if you count how to plug it into the wall. Out of the box, both the X and Y belts had a serious case of whiskey dick. The Y motor mounts are allowed for belt tensioning, but there is no easy way to adjust the X belt. You have to do it the hard way by cutting off the zip ties, pulling it tight, and re-zip tying it up. It's not a huge chore, but it would have been fairly simple to have the X stepper mounted in slots for adjustability, just like they did with the Y stepper. There's no excuse for excluding this basic feature, it's just lazy engineering. The general theme of engineering laziness continues to the basic ergonomics of the KP5L. The microSD port is on the bottom front, which is fine unless the bed is forward. The power switch is in the back, tucked between the Y stepper and the power cord. Again, that's fine unless the bed is back. The card slot is a nuisance, but the inaccessible power switch is kind of a safety concern. If shit goes south, you're probably just going to have to yank the cord out of the machine because you're not getting to the switch while it's printing. The heated bed is insulated, which is good. The insulation is too thick and catches on the Y stepper housing, causing it to occasionally skip steps, which is bad. This is easily resolved by carefully and gently ripping the offending foam the fuck out of the way. Don't forget to peel the plastic film off the bed as well. It should have been removed from the factory, but maybe they thought they were doing a favor for the sort of folks who get off on film peeling. There is no strain relief for the bed cables, unless you count the silicone spooged into the connector. Disappointing, but not surprising. Instead of bed springs, the KP5L comes with silicone spacers. These are usually an upgrade part, and not something that you often see on a cheap printer from the factory. Sweet! The textured glass bed is par for the course. It's functional, and it's no worse than most others, but every glass bed is garbage compared to a proper PEI build plate. I bought one for this printer, but oddly it doesn't fit. Turns out the supposedly 300x300 300 300 printer is actually 310x310. 310 310. The effective print height is also 340mm instead of the claimed 330. Good work, King Room marketing team. So, about those funky rails. They're actually pretty great. Every axis is rock solid and there was no player wobble anywhere. This is good since, while I think they are adjustable, you would need to do quite a bit of disassembly to get to the adjustable bits. The rails themselves appear to be steel rods pressed into C-channel aluminum extrusions, and a carriage that rides on them uses steel wheels. At least I think that they do. You can't actually see them without tearing them apart. This should mean that other than some occasional greasing, they shouldn't need any adjustment or maintenance. Only time will tell, but all rails and both lead screws were appropriately lubed from the factory, so they should be good to go for now. Speaking of the lead screws, while the KP5L has two Z screws with a stepper each, it's only got one Z end switch. Since there's no mechanical interconnect between the two screws, it's very easy for them to become slightly out of whack. Whenever it happened, I just got the left side adjusted to leveling height, slid the carriage over, and then manually adjusted the right Z screw until it was also at leveling height. This is probably the wrong way to do it, but it worked, and I couldn't be bothered to look up the correct procedure. The touchscreen is tiny, but usable. It's the shitty old resistive type of display, so unless you've got fingernails to really press that membrane, you're going to want to use a stylus of some sort. The menus are fine, and they provide the necessary options and features. The only sucky bit is that there are no presets in the preheating menu. You need to manually enter the temperature in 10 degree increments, which takes significantly more button presses than if they had just used presets like every other printer. The tool head is very similar, but not identical, to the KP3S. It uses the same knockoff Titan extruder and the same wacky bespoke hot end. The extruder does its job and is exactly what you'd expect from a cheap Titan copy. The hot end works well enough, but despite looking for all the world like an E3D V6, none of the parts are V6 compatible. It is PTFE line, but in a weird way. Instead of the Bowden tube running all the way down to the nozzle like every other line hot end, 
there's a very thin piece of PTFE tubing permanently pressed into the heat break. The threading on the heat sink and heat block are not V6 standard either, so if you want to upgrade, you need to replace the entire thing. The part cooling fan is a pretty standard 5015 blower, and it has a single duct which may not be ideal, but it does get the job done. The electronics seem to be all new for this printer. This 1.3 revision board has soldered on drivers for the three axes and extruder, but there's an unpopulated socket for a fifth driver if you wanted to add something. For the dual Z steppers, they're simply splitting the signal out from a single driver to the two motors. Adding a fifth driver and using it to drive that second Z stepper directly would be a good use of that open socket. There's also extra inputs that could be used for additional temperature sensors or switches and a dedicated BL touch port. The processor is a Giga Device GD32F303VET6, which is a 32 bit ARM M4 chip with 64K RAM and 512K flash. This is supposedly compatible with the STM32F103, so hopefully it should be just as clipperable as the KP3S. I've been unable to find a stock firmware online yet, and I'm not willing to brick the printer without a fallback image to find out. The power supply is a 24 volt, 360 watt King Room branded affair. The wiring is not terrible and everything seems well secured, but they did just bung the power wires into the screw terminals instead of using ferrules like they should have. It probably won't catch fire? The heat management seems solid at least, with beefy heat sinks on the dryers and what looks like a 60 millimeter fan blowing directly on the board. So that's all the bits and pieces, but how does it work as a whole? Well, it almost doesn't. King Rune made no accommodations whatsoever for the filament path. The filament feeds into the bottom of the runout sensor, comes out the top, and then makes a hard 90 degree turn as the carriage yanks it back and forth. This is terrible and it causes prints to fail. They did give me a link to PTFE tubing, but the manual makes no mention of it and there's no way to attach it to the runout sensor. The best I could do was zip tie it to the tool head cable and hope for the best. This did help and I actually got some prints to finish, but it's sloppy and it's unreliable and it's not a long-term solution. This was just going to be a review video of the printer as shipped, but this filament path issue is a legit roadblock. It's just about unusable without a printed fix, so I designed a proper reverse Bowden bracket and printed it in color matching orange ABS on my KP3S. Look at that little guy helping out his big brother. This wasn't a particular challenging design or print, but it shouldn't be necessary to design and print something just to make a brand new printer functional. There's a link to the model in the description if you want to print one for yourself. The bracket also doubles as a support for the sad flaccid tool head cable, and it helps keep it from drooping down into the print area. The filament runout sensor was more trouble than it's worth, so I ditched it. It adds significant drag to the filament, and print resume almost never works in practice anyway. Luckily, the printer prints just fine without the sensor installed. With the filament path sorted out, I could actually do some test prints. The results were solidly okay. This benchy was printed fastish at 60 to 80 millimeters per second with Solutech PLA, and it looks pretty respectable. This calibration print shows excellent overhang, no stringing, and fairly impressive bridging. I needed some more desk ink cups for filament storage, so I printed a few in vase mode using some no-name green PLA that came free with another printer. It's garbage filament, and it's pretty wet. The KP5L printed it just fine. This Calicat printed in Sunlu PETG also came out great. I wanted to do at least one big print. So here's a 300% scale shithead Putin in Sunlu Copper Silk PLA. I hate printing silk PLA because it's such a pain in the ass, but I also hate fascists, so that seemed appropriate. It's far from flawless, but 100% of that can be attributed to the inherent awfulness of silk PLA, the dampness of this particular roll, and my stubborn refusal to tune for it. Printer did its job admirably, though, and completed the 13-hour print without shitting the bed, which is really all anybody can ask of it. So what's the moral of the story? Should you buy a King Rune KP5L? If this is going to be your first printer, probably not. Not unless you have somebody that can help you unfuck the filament path issue by printing a fix. I mean, you could half-ass it by zip-tying the Bowden tube to the cable and babysitting it while it prints a reverse Bowden bracket, but that's not the sort of mess I'd actually suggest a newbie get themselves mired in. However, if this isn't your first rodeo, and you're looking to add a larger bed slinger to your collection, and you're okay dealing with the issues that need fixing, I'd say it's worth considering. The KP5L is not only significantly cheaper than most other recent large format 3D printers, the rail system makes it a lot sturdier and potentially faster and more precise as well. At the very least, you'll need to address the filament path and bed cable strain relief. Ideally, you'll want to solve the janky dual Z setup by either adding a timing belt between the two Z lead screws, or going the complicated route by adding a second Z driver, a leveling probe, and a sequence to automatically level the gantry using those additions. You're also going to need to convert it to clipper to get the most out of what the motion system can theoretically offer, but assuming it's possible, it will almost certainly be worth the minimal effort. If the KP5M ever shows up for sale and is somewhere in the $250 range, that would be a very compelling buy as well. Here's hoping King Rune fixes the design deficiencies before then. Well, that's all I got on the KP5L. Hopefully it's been educational.